our website. So this will be a resource uh, for people who are not able to attend um, after the land use lunch hour. All right, so I'm gonna kick it off to Sophia to get to get us started. Yeah, so again, this will just be sort of a, a high level quick overview of the amendments, but the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency oversees uh, development in, essentially in the Tahoe Basin, um, both the California side and the Nevada side. And right now they are considering some housing amendments. Um, and these would be incentives for deed restricted, affordable, moderate and achievable housing. And we'll go over what those different definitions mean here in just a minute. Um, essentially they're trying to address the housing crisis. We know that there is a lack of housing for the workforce, for, for low income community members um, in Trekkie in North Lake Tahoe, across the state, honestly, across the country, it's it's a big problem. Um, and so they are trying to identify solutions that would help incentivize developers to build some of those housing products that are needed. Um, in town centers, they are proposing unlimited density. So, uh, you know, essentially as many people as you can fit into sort of the smaller geographical area. Uh, unlimited coverage. So, you know, well, again, while we have a couple of slides to talk about what is coverage, but it's actually the percentage of a lot that has something built on top of it. Um, and so unlimited would mean, you know, you could build to the very edge of something. Also increasing height. I think height is an easier one for most, most folks to understand, um, you know, 56 feet to 65 feet in town centers, and then no minimum parking requirement with a parking strategy. So they have talked about, um, essentially allowing developers to come up with their own parking strategies. Something might be, you know, working with a, a neighboring commercial development and saying, hey, you need commercial, you need parking during the day, we need parking in the evening. Is there some way that we can sort of share parking resources? They are also proposing in multifamily zones, again, unlimited density. So as many units as you can fit in, in the acre. Um, increasing coverage from 30% right now, you can only put you know, some sort of building or development on 30% of a, a parcel. And so that would go up to 70%. And then uh, also parking reduction from 0.75 spaces per unit on av or point uh, establishing a parking requirement of 0.75 spaces per unit on average. And then they've also developed a couple of transition zones, which are essentially kind of in between those town centers and town centers are cores, so kind of the core areas. So you might think of um, Kings Beach or Tahoe City or South Lake Tahoe, um, Incline Village, you know, and then sort of the multifamily kind of, you know, edges out from there. And then the transition zones sort of fill some of that gap in between, um, but also providing the same incentives as multifamily zones and an additional 11 feet in height as well in those areas. So just briefly, you know, height, again, this is the one that's easy to understand, but the the tallest building in um, North Lake Tahoe right now in, in the Placer County portion of North Lake Tahoe is the Domus Workforce Housing um, Building. It's in Kings Beach. It's 48 feet tall. And so this would allow for up to 65 feet tall, again, for that de-restricted housing type. And I think coverage uh, and density get a little bit more complicated, but so coverage, again, is the percentage of the total site that's occupied by structures. So that could be the actual building itself. It could be sheds. It could be, um, you know, decks. It could be the parking area, paving coverage. Um, I stole this image from the town of Trekkie, so thank you, town of Trekkie, but this is sort of how they show what coverage looks like. And again, in town centers, they're proposing unlimited coverage. So, you know, buildings up until the very edge of the site. I had one more in there. I might have skipped it out on it. Um, but yeah, maybe I'll try to transfer it back to Alexis and um, to talk a little bit about, give an example of what some of those town centers, transition zones, and multifamily residential zones actually look like. Yeah, so these are, um, you know, just as a, as a resource on our TRPA housing amendments page on the MAP website, which if you haven't visited, visited that website, you can find it through our homepage, uh, mountainareapreservation.org. But these are the GIS uh, parcel maps from TRPA. There's a wonderful resource that the TRPA has, a GIS portal of the whole basin. And you can literally zoom and move around the entire basin for, um, for to understand the town centers, the transition zones and the multifamily. So this is a snapshot 
of Tahoe City and actually not really all of Tahoe City, but um, because, you know, outside of the town center of Tahoe City, you have a multifamily residential area, um, which is the Lake Forest. And then you have multifamily residential at Sunnyside, Tahoma and Homewood. But this gives you a synopsis of a town center, a transition zone and the multifamily. And you can turn on the different layers and the, the GIS uh, mapping portal to really illustrate what what potential opportunity sites there could be or potential concerns with sites that haven't been fully analyzed. And I think it's important to understand when considering these uh, code amendments, um, the last environmental analysis done for the basin was the 2012 e uh, environmental impact report and environmental impact statement for the regional plan update. So the majority of the environmental data that the TRPA is depending on for these code amendments is from 2011. So that's also important information to kind of have in your back pocket. But it's it's this kind of gives you a visual of what the code amendments mean and where these code amendments could be um, taken, right? What parcels they could uh, be utilized on and what type of land use changes we could see coming through from these code amendments. And Alexis, did we have a density slide? Did we go back? Like we skipped one. Go back. There ah, it is. Oh, okay. okay. I'll there just cover this really briefly too, because density is a really important one. And I think especially for any development in the Tahoe Basin, there's a lot of confusion around what density is and what that means. So the TRPA actually has an overall cap on the amount of additional development that's allowed in the Tahoe Basin. So there's just a number and that's that's what is potentially on the table. However, these particular amendments are looking at focusing out of the, all the of the development that, that's available, focusing that development in certain areas. And so I, I had just a couple of slides or a couple of um, graphics here. You can see, you know, density would be one unit per acre. You've got a single family dwelling. You've got one house on a, on a lot. Um, six units per acre, you can sort of see what that looks like. 35 units per acre, you might get some more of the duplexes and triplexes and a little bit um, more density in that capacity. And then I showed one of 75 units per acre. Again, these are just these are just graphics. This isn't an, an um, it's not an accurate rendering of what this would actually look like, but just to give you a sense of what that would be. And so again, TRPA is proposing unlimited density. So as dense as you can possibly make it on that particular lot and with that height. Um, so it could be a lot of a lot of units in a small geographic area, but again, the overall density in the Tahoe Basin would remain the same. Okay, now we can move on from density, but just think that's a, an important one to cover. So in terms of maps concerns, we've got a number of different concerns here. I think you know foremost is the definition of achievable housing that that the TRPA has adopted. We think that that leaves a little bit of a, a loophole on the table um, in terms of the achievable housing definition. So right now, the achievable housing definition essentially says that a local worker has to work in the Tahoe Unified School District for at least 30 hours per week in order to qualify for, um, for this housing, for this deed restricted housing. And we've heard that the TRPA is amending that definition to ensure that you have to physically work in, in the Tahoe Basin for 30 hours per week and not just you know work for a, a company that has a business license, maybe you're a remote worker. Um, I think that the concern here in terms of the loophole is, is basically just that you know, if you're providing all these incentives and you're saying, okay, you can you can build this achievable housing, there's no income cap. So that could just be market rate housing. Um and we've seen in, in the town of Truckee, there was an audit done on an, a specific workforce housing project. We've seen that if there isn't really strong deed restriction enforcement, that um, sometimes these units end up going to folks who don't actually live in, in the area and it's not going to the local workers and it might become second homes or ski leases. Um, 
And so it just leaves a lot on the table. We want to make sure that these units are actually going to the folks who need them, the folks who are here, the folks who are powering the community, the locals. Um, we don't want to see more ski leases. We don't want to see more second homes. And we want to make sure that if there is um, this sort of achievable housing is an option on the table, we think that more developers will want to utilize that than other kinds of development because it would require the least amount of subsidies. Um, and so we're just concerned that if the deed restriction is not really strong and that language isn't really spelled out in these codes, that we're going to end up seeing uh, more of what we already have, which is, you know, second homes and ski leases. Alexis, anything to add on that one? I was just going to add that um, a part a part of um, I would say some of the justification from TRPA to bring forward these types of extreme code amendments is to really rationalize that they won't need the subsidies, right? So that if these if these code amendments were passed, developers won't need subsidies. We have actually found out that that really the affordable and moderate and potentially achievable would still need subsidies. We all understand the cost of development is very high. And the only way that you can really address the cost of development is doing modular. And we've also seen that modular housing, while it is um, coming forward in the in the mountains due to snow loads, there are concerns and issues with the quality of that type of development. So, you know, there's a number of pieces here with the achievable housing. And really, if you share this breakdown of these types of housing, um, you know, most developers are going to pursue the type of housing that is the 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 least challenging and and to bring forward, and that will be more achievable. And it's not to say that that we don't need missing middle housing, we absolutely do. But if the focus is all missing middle, what sort of equity in our workforce housing are we bringing forward to the basin? And that is an issue that we have brought up with TRPA. Um, some of our other concerns is, um, you know, Tahoe is not in a bubble. There are cumulative impacts. Um, there are there's a lot of growth on the table outside of the basin. Everything from the Carson Valley to Reno to Truckee, and yes, everybody is working to address the housing crisis issue. But I think it's important that um, the 2011 Regional Plan Update Environmental Analysis has not considered a number of the cumulative impacts that MAP is monitoring and concerned with. So that is a, a piece that we have continued to flag. Um, parking strategies designed by developers doesn't sound good. It, it sounds like more, um, more of actually what many communities are already dealing with in the basin, which is a lack of ability to park, especially on multifamily, and people move those cars around. So we've seen that. We've seen it with Domus. Um, and anyone who understands the Kings Beach community understands the hardships of finding parking, um, whether you have a, a single family residential or you live in multifamily. And the other piece is really, you know, incentivizing, you know, a lot of density advantages outside of our town centers. Part of the vision of the regional plan update was a focus on those town centers, really prioritizing infill, redevelopment, revitalization. If these code amendments are incentivizing outside town center incentives, that will increase sprawl. And without the appropriate mitigation measures in place and transit, um, especially with our fixed route transit and a lack of headways, whether it be 15 minute to 30 minute headways, right now our fixed routes are hour long headways, we might be making a bad situation worse with these housing code amendments, especially if we're not doing our due diligence and really evaluating the sites, the 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 constraints, and then of course the um, the cumulative impacts. Additional concerns, and none of this is new to many of you because we live in a community where we, we live with fire, but wildfire evacuation, you know, after the Caldor fire, many of us are, are more concerned than ever about what happens in an evacuation. And frankly, for those of us who live here, it's not us, it's the sheer amount of visitors coming to our community who are not prepared, who do, who do not understand what it means to live in a community with wildfire risk. So, you know, that's an, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. And we feel like we're getting a lot of, um, don't worry, emergency services have that figured out, but 
if we're not analyzing it with these code amendments and these land use changes, um, we're not fully addressing the situation and, and we're not we're not putting forward good mitigation for residents and visitors to understand. Um, tall buildings have a have a shading effect. And yes, they the TRPA did add in that there would be a requirement for shade analysis. Um, and that's great, but I also think that it's it's going to be a really challenging um, enforcement to say to to limit building heights and understanding how a tall building can make an entire street or walkway never see the sun. And now you know we're all dealing with winter coming in. It's snowing right now, and you've got snow coming in. You've got uh, cold mornings. And you have public safety issues with tall buildings, especially in a mountain community. The other piece is the scenic and community character impacts. And yes, TRPA has stringent scenic thresholds, um, but it's still it's it 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 becomes an issue when you start to prioritize tall buildings in a mountain community and how it impacts ridge lines, view sheds. Um, and then, of course, the public safety with tall buildings and shadow effects with not allowing enough solar aspect on your roadways to to reduce that impact. And then lack of transit. It's that is nothing new. Yes, we have wonderful micro transit that's coming forward. But really, you want to move a lot of people at once. That is increasing your headways on your fixed route transit. And Tahoe is behind. We, we are all we always have a vision for better uh, transit and it's always waiting on more funding. So um, those are those are some of the big high level concerns with these amendments. I'm going to pass it over to Sophie to talk about the process. Yeah, so I think from a public process, this has been a very fast track timeline. Um, you know, there has been the Tahoe Living Working Group, which sort of led to the development of these amendments, and that's been going on for a couple of years, but we didn't know about it. So I'm guessing that most of the community didn't know about it either. The first that we learned about these housing amendments was actually in May with a presentation from TRPA staff to the Incline Village and Crystal Bay Citizen Advisory Board. Um, and then since then, there was a housing webinar in September, and I think that that was probably the best opportunity to actually learn about what these amendments were and ask questions. And then um, TRPA staff put out some FAQs afterward to answer additional questions, but not really a whole lot of time between that and then the full, you know, sort of approval process. It went to the Regional Plan Implementation Committee in September, Advisory Planning Commission in November, and then the second Regional Plan Implementation Committee meeting in November, and we're already at approval and adoption next week. So, um, you know, I think while there is definitely a, a hope that the community has an opportunity to sort of weigh in and help to shape some of the amendments, there's also Kind of the reality that this is happening so fast that it's really hard i think for there to be a lot of consideration of the input that's coming forward just because they're trying to move forward so quickly um but with that you know next week is sort of the the end all be all or potentially i mean unless they decide to postpone or decide to hold another meeting but as of right now that's the end all be all final meeting for these amendments So we have developed some other ideas that we're hoping that the TRPA might consider. So first off, just limiting those incentives to town centers for now, because again, that's what the community has supported. Those town centers were really meaning, meaningfully outlined and, and sort of agreed upon by the community. So let's limit our incentives to those locations now and then consider other sites in the future. So that brings me to two. We could identify some sites outside of town centers that might be appropriate for additional density and coverage but we really need to go through a, a thoughtful process and, and identify those specific locations rather than just saying, okay, a blanket approach, let's put this density in everywhere that's zoned multifamily. We would also like for the TRPA to consider unlocking some existing housing stock through considering um, you know, various short-term rental policies we've seen uh, in other communities where they've implemented short-term rental bans, that that has actually opened up 10 to 15% of the housing stock to locals for rentals. Um, you know, so if there's, you know, about four to 5,000 STRs in Tahoe, that would be about 500 to 900 um, new, new units for locals to potentially rent. So that's a, a great option as well. 
Um, we'd also love for the TRPA to consider a basin-wide workforce housing preservation program. I know that Placer County has a great program called Lease to Locals, where they actually subsidize and, and pay property owners to, to lease their homes to local residents. So that's a, a great option as well. It does need some sort of um, sustainable funding source. So that's a, it's a big question. It's a definitely, these are not easy solutions, but other ideas to consider. Um, as we mentioned, enforcing deed restrictions is of the utmost importance if you're having any sort of deed restricted um, housing, because we want to make sure that these houses are actually going to the folks that need and going to the intended um, recipients of these houses. We would also love for them to consider an achievable housing income cap. Again, you know, just saying um, if we allow developers to sort of choose the housing that they want to develop, they're probably going to choose what makes the most economic sense, which means a lot of this housing will fall in this achievable definition range. Um, and that could end up being kind of market rate housing. And so we want there to be an income cap. So this is really going to the locals who need it. Um, for us, parking is a big is a big issue. We just don't want to create another problem by trying to solve this problem. We fully agree that there needs to be better transit and that you need to have more riders to increase transit opportunities and, and have sustainable funding for that. But we're just not there yet, in our opinion. Um, we, we think there's still a long way to go. Transit headways are very long. And we know that 96% of the folks who actually live in Tahoe have at least one vehicle. So it just makes sense to have a place to put that vehicle. And then finally, um, these would also apply, these incentives would also apply to mixed use projects. So you might have a commercial, a shop on the bottom and then housing above. Um, we wanna make sure that that deed restricted housing is built as far as part of the first phase. We've seen other developers come forward and say, oh no, we can't we can't build the, the housing um, first. We need, to, we need to build the part that's gonna make us money first, which it does make sense. But then we've also seen that sometimes you have to hold their feet to the fire to make them actually build that housing. So we want the community benefit to be provided upfront. Alexis, anything I missed on that one? Okay, I'll pass it back to you for our call to action. Yeah. So, you know, obviously you heard during the public process timeline that this has been quick and, and I can tell you for us, we, we have been doing the best we can to reach out to TRPA staff, to TRPA governing board members, um, our partners, our environmental conservation partners to really understand these amendments. And like Sophia said, uh, we have heard that next week is the final decision. So if you have the opportunity to attend a hearing on Wednesday, December 13th, that starts at 9 a.m., you can not only attend in, in person in South Lake Tahoe, um, but you could also attend via Zoom as well. And we're really encouraging people to submit public comments, submit them in advance to uh, the TRPA. You can see the email address right there, public comments at trpa.gov. Uh, and then you can also make comments on the Zoom or in person. And if you are a seasoned uh, commenter at government hearings, you only get th three minutes and that's not much not much to convey what you want to convey. So if you do have a lot to share, we suggest you write out, you, you submit public comments in advance, and then come up with a three-minute verbal comment that maybe distills your written comments. Um, and alternatively, if, if you can't do any of that, but you agree that this is not the right of set of code amendments, you can send our form letter to the TRPA governing board members asking for alternatives and asking for new environmental analysis. I think we have had maybe some something like 270 people have sent that letter off to the governing board members. Um, we've had many conversations with governing board members regarding um, our letter and the alternatives we would like to see considered as well as new environmental analysis. But if there's a time to make your voice heard, it is right now. And we would love for you to participate and really bring your ideas forward. Because when it comes to housing, um, there's lots of ideas and there's lots of solutions. There's not one solution, but I think um, anyone who's living in the basin, especially as a workforce employee, understands that right now there is a huge equity question happening in the basin. And if we really want to further workforce housing that's meaningful, and meaningful to our workforce, then we these code amendments need to be much more stringent, and they and they need to be limited, um, because it there's just there's 
we're too afraid that it's going to further the exact issue that we have right now, more market rate housing with some sort of local deed restriction. And I think for those of us who live in Truckee, we've seen the tax credit projects move forward. We've seen the local market rate projects move forward. We, we've learned a lot. And so if we can help the basin do a better job on driving the appropriate land uses that help to address our workforce, let's do it. And so that's that's why we're having this land use lunch hour. And um, and we really want to open it up and, and find out what questions you all have, suggestions, thoughts, um, and and really hear from from the community. Yeah, and remember, please um, raise your hand if you have a, a comment and you can unmute yourself, I believe, and, and then uh, ask your comment to everybody. Yep, Jan, go ahead. Yeah, I was looking at the list of um, the changes you'd like to see, and I was curious, um, which of these um, do you think would do the most to in increase the workforce or low income housing is it lowering the the rental cap because i think there's already a rental cap of somewhere under 4000 units you're thinking it should be go down to 2000 or something like that or and then but more broadly which of the recommendations um do you see yielding more workforce housing and by how much Yeah, I'll take that one. I can start off anyway. Um, I think that a short-term rental cap or ban um, would be the best way to get workforce housing units the fastest um, because that's existing housing stock. So, you know, it would have sort of the quickest turnover rate, um, you know, in terms of it, like we mentioned kind of during the presentation in other jurisdictions that have implemented bans, 10 to 15% of the stock does turn into long-term rentals um, or get sold to locals. And so, you know, again, if that's about 5,000 units in the basin, that's 500 to 900 units that could be unlocked, you know, in the next year or so, if that were to be implemented and actually move forward. And I believe that the city of South Lake Tahoe, um, they actually did implement a ban recently. So I'm really curious to see how that's been functioning. It's been something I've been wanting to look into a little bit more. Um, in terms of what would bring, in addition to that, what I mean, I think that's the best, fastest solution, but maybe not an easy one politically to get accomplished. Um, in terms of bringing more units online, I don't know, Alexis, what do you think on, on that one? I mean, I think part of what the TRPA is hoping is that these these land use incentives and advantages bring forward more developers to pursue these types of projects. Um, we have heard, though, that the low income and moderate would still need subsidies. And anyone who understands what subsidies means understands that that could be years of tax credit Um applications for those federal subsidies and state subsidy dollars. And again, you know, speaking from experience, we supported the Truckee Artist Lofts here in Truckee. They went through three rounds of tax credit projects, multiple years to then finally get that tax credit. So when a project was approved in 2015 and it doesn't commence development until 2019, that's a huge loss of time. And, and not only does is it a huge loss of time, your construction costs go up. So I think a part of our concern just in general with these amendments is that if the TRPA wants to really promote um, incentives that don't require subsidies, th this set of packet, this, this set of code amendments will further achievable housing which is not the type of housing that the service sector needs. That is a higher income level. So, you know, I do believe that if, if, if the goal is to bring forward as many workforce housing units as possible, some of the unlocking of existing housing units and the short-term rental bans or even a cap 
is what creates those opportunities much faster than an actual development land use application process. That said, within Placer County, Placer has been working on the Dollar Creek Crossing project for a number of years. And that project is set to bring forward 150 units um, in the proposal with a variety of different units. So everything from low income to moderate to a for purchase. Now, I think that's important to understand is that, that all of these projects are gonna have different components because one part of the project is gonna help to offset the cost of the other projects. So we just heard from, we just had a call before the Zoom with um, Supervisor Gustafson. And that's the, that's the deal. Right now, these units are coming in at 800,000 a unit. So 800,000 a unit for a workforce housing developer is very expensive. So even with these incentives, subsidies will still be needed. And those processes take one to two, and from our experience, four years. So I can't exactly tell you, Jan, exactly what is going to bring forward the product. But I think from our experience, it's really complicated to... Um, prioritize certain types of housing and also ensure that there's equity. So I, I I think, you know, from our perspective, we can't necessarily tell you which um, new code amendment is going to drive forward the type of product that the basin needs. But we do have um, a little understanding from developers of what types of products that they would be bringing forward. Thank you. Any other questions? And again, this can be on anything related to the TRPA housing code amendments. I do know we have a lot of North Lake Tahoe people on this call, and I know that many of you have engaged on the Tahoe Basin area plan, but that is a separate land use um amendments under Placer County that was approved, um, but we're not, we're not focusing on the Tahoe Basin Area Plan amendments for Placer County today, but we are happy to address any um, questions or even just thoughts. You're a quiet bunch these days. And I just also wanted to throw out there that we tried to make this simple, but it's never simple. Even as I listen to ourselves talk, I think, oh man, that was, that's a little complicated. That's a little complicated. So your question doesn't have to be some sort of in-depth question either. It could just be, could you go back to density and explain that again? Like, what is it? Why, why is the, there a, 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 you know, a growth management system in Tahoe? What does that development capacity look like? Anything is on the table. And we can also wrap up soon if, if there aren't any questions. I think I, I'm just going to also put out one thing because I think if you have been engaging in the TRPA meetings, it's been really confusing to understand kind of who, um, you know, for instance, Placer County has a Tahoe Basin area plan that was approved. It was approved on October 31st. It then has made its way to the TRPA hearings. And so, you know, there's been a discussion of, well, what if a county in the basin can satisfy their housing without these code amendments? TRPA has said that there is an opportunity to opt out, but after these are approved, basically all of the counties within the basin have a year to then pr basically pursue a different plan. So I think that's another important piece to consider is, um, you know, each county, whether it's Placer County or Douglas County or El Dorado County, is going to have to illustrate to TRPA that in Washoe County, you know, TRPA that they are working to satisfy housing and bring forward deed restricted housing. And I'll just add the cities can do that too Carson City and South Lake Tahoe, City of South Lake Tahoe. I mean, maybe everybody's just enjoying their lunch. 
either we did a really great job of explaining this or this is just way over everyone's heads. I'm not sure which, but um, I think that we can go ahead and close it out if there aren't any additional questions. But just a reminder, we will post this recording on our website. We do have an open letter if you want to sign on to our perspective. Um, we also encourage you to come up with your own perspectives on these um, and submit comments. Join us at the meeting. It's more fun when there are more people there and you're not alone giving comments. So we hope to see some faces next week. Um, and then also if you can't attend in person, I know it's in South Lake Tahoe, that's not easy for a lot of the North Lake folks or Trekkie folks. Um, definitely you can also join online. So yeah, with that, I'll just say thanks everyone for attending. We'll also, I would love to hear if there is anything we could do to improve this process for our next month's um, land use lunch hour or topics that you'd like to hear about. So we'll try to send out a follow-up email to our participants as well, asking for, for some, um, for some feedback. Thank you, everyone.